up, I would like to ask Sasha from the Open Technology Institute to take the stage. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? No, there's that you speak in English, which we'll be doing later. Yes, I, I actually am a dual citizen uh, of both Germany and America, which means that I speak great English, but unlike all of y'all, I speak horrible German. Uh, so I will be speaking in English today. And I, w I wanted to start by just saying thank you. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for hosting me here. Uh, I've been coming to Seabase now uh, since before the bar existed, uh, <laughs> which is, we're trying to figure out exactly what year that was, uh, since it was a bellwether year, of course. Uh, but probably around seven or eight years uh, that I've been coming back here. And my own background is one where I got started in these spaces. Should I talk louder? <laughs> All right, so I got started in these spaces working in a place called Indie Media. I don't know, who's heard of Indie Media before? All right, so this is a pretty savvy room. Uh, back in 2000, well, 1999, a bunch of friends uh, went to went to Seattle and took part in the protests there and helped create what became the first independent media center. And I was prevented from going uh, by my then uh, psychology department. I was a grad student there. And uh, instead I did logistics and helped support them, which led to my accidentally becoming uh, first the treasurer for our local independent media center and later the treasurer for the Global Indie Media Network. Uh, so to this day, the Global Indie Media Network is fiscally sponsored out of Urbana, Illinois, because that's where I was in grad school and that's where I had a lot of free time and that's a strange history. And in that time, I spent a lot of time both setting up structures for indie media, but also a lot of time fighting against government oppression. I had friends of mine regularly locked up, uh, two of them, for those who remember Brad Will and Rachel Corey, were killed uh, during my tenure there. This has real life and death implications, this work. And in 2004 and 2005, we were the subject of direct government intervention. They, they stole our servers and we fought against this for multiple years with uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation and others eventually got them returned and learned a lot about what was happening in terms of active government surveillance that we were then hit with a series of gag orders that we couldn't talk about for years upon years. So eventually Nick Merrill was able to come out and talk about this more publicly. Uh, and a number of us kind of were radicalized. I guess we were already radicalized, but we were even more radicalized by this notion that the US government, which had completely denied for years any sort of involvement in the server seizure that we had, was in fact the Emperor Palpatine behind this entire endeavor. They were pulling the strings and they were the ones that took our servers and locked down, it was at the time about 20 independent media centers, prevented them from doing our jobs as citizen journalists. At about the same time in 2000 that we were developing, building the indie media, what became the global indie media network, and we're producing all these media and using these newfangled like mini disc recorders. And you know, if, if you guys all remember the old cameras where you had like the little like three and a half inch drive, you could take like three pictures and then you'd like have to pass out the, yeah. So we were using those, we thought this was awesome. And we had no real mechanism to get these media out to our community. Those that were lucky enough to have university accounts might have a dial up modem, but there was no meaningful broadband to speak of in 2000. And I was a naive psychology major and took on as a summer project this notion that, hey, you know what we should totally do? We should build our own community wireless network. And I was like, we'll have it done by August, <laughs> no problem. Uh, that was 13 years ago. And along that route, uh, got really involved in setting up this notion of a local 
community wireless network, but also then in this notion of, hey, there's these other groups on the west coast of America, in Berlin, in Austria, places around the globe that people were developing and realizing the potential for these new found 802.11 Wi-Fi, or what became the Wi-Fi standard devices. And wouldn't it be cool if we all interconnected? And I think this is really a foundational element of what then becomes the next dozen years of my life, which is that there is no way in hell any one group can do this alone. There's no way in how we have the technical acumen or the capacities to do that. And given that the potential for these technologies are quite global, quite profound on a global stage, it made all the sense in the world to interconnect all of these folks. And so in 2004, we hosted what was then the National Summit for, Internet for Community Wireless Networks. And what quickly became the International Summit when we realized like nationally there's only a few of us, but internationally there's a bunch of us. And it's what brings me to town today that we're hosting now, I guess we're about into year nine of hosting these summits. The next one's gonna be right next door and it brings together, in essence, a lot of the global leadership, not all by any means, but a lot of the global leadership of this endeavor. Now, I'm a strange bird. I spend my days, day in and day out, working in Washington, D.C., educating policymakers around issues of technology and surveillance and et cetera. It's a, let me just say that like, the level of education is here. <laughs> Everyone thinks their level of education is right here. And my job is to explain like there's a little bit more than what you think you know uh, in a lot of these endeavors. And of course, as of three, four months ago, this has now become like a nightmare in Washington, DC. And so, I'm a strange bird in that I work in a think tank and I do this work. I'm a strange bird because I come out of these spaces that have traditionally been anti-government. I come out of spaces whereby commotion and indie media were set up to monitor and protect us against government malfeasance. They were directly responsive. And the early battles that we were a part of, the protests I was a part of, were happening inside the United States. Right? In New York, in Washington, D.C., Seattle. And it's really interesting because 10 years on, we managed to convince, I have no idea how, but we managed to convince the US State Department to support open source mesh wireless research and development. Not at like 10,000 or 100,000 euros, a multi-million dollar grant to support this work. Well, that's a Faustian bargain in the extreme and no one is more skeptical than I. And we were able to sell it by saying no one will trust us and nor should they unless everything is completely open source and freely available. That was our protective element. Open source became the mechanism by which we could say, look, if you think we're doing something wrong, the answer is to make everything completely transparent so that everyone can justify for themselves, can look into the bowels of the code and determine that nothing is Wrong. And this is what protected us when all the shit came down about how the NSA has gone and manipulated all of these various things. And, you know, like we had the discussion internally of like which elliptical curve cryptography should we use? And it was like clearly the open one. And thank God we did, <laughs> since the other one is broken. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, just as an aside, it is amazing when NIST, right, one government agency is recommending that you don't use its own products because another government agency has completely uh, broken theirs. But along that way, we were also able to, in essence, take a lot of these global endeavors, this work that we've been doing for years upon years. I know a bunch of the people in this room from working together for years upon years and accelerate development around the globe. We were able to, in essence, infuse a lot of different projects all around the globe with the support necessary to make these projects really take off. And that's what we've been doing. And according to the State Department, according to the US government, this is all for use out there, right? This is for Tehran, this is for North Korea, this is for Cuba, this is for China. It doesn't take a genius to understand this is really gonna be useful everywhere. 
And what we've seen in the last three to four months is a flip of interest in the commotion project from almost everyone coming in from overseas to a whole hell of a lot of people domestically saying, we want to use this system here in our own backyards. And to me, that's indicative of the US government doing things that inside America people are profoundly uncomfortable and actively in opposition to. When I think about global reactions to NSA, to Iran's halal net, to China's great firewall, I think it's actually incredibly parsimonious. It's incredibly clean, which is that we don't want any of that. We want a network that we have control over. The locus of control is with us, the users, where we have control not just over our communications, but the devices that we are attaching to these networks. And so I think that the import of community wireless in particular, of the research and development efforts that we're engaged in, is all the more profound and immediate right now. What I'm fighting in DC every day is what I see as a foundational groundwork that's being laid not to roll back what we've done, but to shift surveillance from network-based. We have something called CALEA, the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act. This is the one that in essence mandates that all of these networks have to be surveillable. The shift is from that, surveillance in the network, to a move to lay the groundwork for surveillance in your devices. And we already see this, right? We already see this with cell phones whose operating systems keep coming back. They're like the zombie operating system. You think it's dead, but you know you're only like 30 minutes into the horror flick and it's gonna come back at you. Like the NAND chips that we've seen in some of these things, the trusted computing chips that we see being put into a lot of laptops. This is really bad news. Because in the future, it won't just be the cell phones and the laptops, right? It'll be every, like what internet, what Vint Cerf declares the internet of things, right? Your toaster is going to be determining when it's turned on and reporting that back. And so they'll know like when you get up in the morning. That's not a good scene. And so I think community wireless is really about this battle, this, what, that is raging like, with the forces of liberation on one side, and this unholy trifecta on the other. And that, that trifecta, I'll lay it out for you right now. Like, it's the incumbent internet service providers, it's copyright holders, and it's a law enforcement mechanism that's run amok, and it's operationalized through PRISM, through the NSA, through this cyber industrial complex that has been growing not at 10 or 20% a year, but at three and 400% a year. Right? This is now a multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry that we're now all in opposition to. So I view community wireless as about liberation. I view community wireless about freedom of expression. I believe that it is about moving beyond equal access which is when you get progressive types in government, they talk about that. But what they mean is like access is available to anyone at a price set by internet service providers. To we need to move into equitable adoption. And that means economic justice. That means digital literacy. That means safety in our communications. All of these elements that are right now completely outside of the political debate. That's what the future of community wireless has to be. That's what the history of community wireless has been about. So I run this thing, this Commotion Wireless project. We've got developer release two out right now. We are on schedule to release version 1.0 at the end of this year. For me, it's the culmination of 13 years of my life. It's absolutely not perfect. I would benefit greatly, my teams would benefit greatly, the project, humanity would benefit greatly from having you all bang on it and break it and tell us why we suck. That would be really useful. So please do do that. 
But we have an overarching vision, and it's very simple. Free, safe, ubiquitous communications for everyone on the planet. And that can only be accomplished through a global network of people everywhere helping to support that vision. So I'll stop there, take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sasha, for sharing that with us and also just touching on some of the topics that will be addressed and dealt with during the next three days. Other questions? Okay, and all your detailed questions will be, yes, addressed in Q&A sessions and panels um, the next three days here at CBase. So I'm looking forward to all those sessions. Thank you very much, Sasha. So next up, I would like to ask...